back in Basingstoke, and this time I'm up on Chapel Hill, north of the railway station, and exploring the ruins of the chapels of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to another explore. This is the Chapel of the Holy Ghost, and this is the oldest remains on the site, dating back to 1244, so it's mid 13th century. And its construction came about due to a dispute between King John and the Pope, Pope Innocent in 1208, which led to the Pope banning religious service in England. So, unable to use churchyards to bury their dead, Basingstoke's residents turned to this area of unconsecrated ground here on Chapel Hill. There's also then it was known as the Lytton. And then in 1214 the ban was lifted and the ground, obviously because it was full of buried people, was finally consecrated and it paved the way for the construction of the Chapel of the Holy Ghost which you see the remains of before you. And what you actually see there is the remains of a former tower. Now looking round, obviously there's quite a bit of flint work here. The brickwork, these buttresses, obviously later additions, probably Victorian, while they look, well these bricks at least. There's quite a bit of work gone on. Now, during the reign of King Henry VIII, the chapel was supported by a guild made up of Basingstoke residents. But when Henry died in 1547, the new king, Edward VI, sold off the guild's assets and it was wound up. Fast forward to Queen Mary's reign, and in 1554 the guild was revived again. As part of this revival, it was stated that a priest should be appointed for the instruction and education of young men and boys of Basingstoke and incorporated into the Holy Ghost Chapel Tower, Queen Mary School continued here until 1855 when it moved to nearby Worting. Standing in the original nave area, you look towards the tower, or what the remains of the tower, and there's two things that stick out. Now the first one is this, which looks to be a tomb, but I don't think it is. I think it's just an effigy or a statue mounted upon some bricks. But the poor lad, as you can see, is rather headless. And his feet haven't fared too well either. But it's believed that this is thought to be an alderman of the Guild of the Holy Ghost. And that's, if you remember, the body that was responsible for building the school on this site. Now obviously this isn't the original position of this statue. I think it's been laid here probably once again during Victorian times to commemorate that school. Now the second thing is up on this wall we have what clearly looks like a plaque. It's very pitted and damaged. 
Now this plaque was probably erected around the 1670s and it gives the names of some of the school's former masters with the earliest dating back to 1639. And obviously you can only read the first few lines and unfortunately they're in Latin. However, a full translation does exist in the nearby Vine School. So I'll just read the first few lines or, or that you can see on the plaque and it says inscription and names of some of the masters on the wall of the old school Anno Domini 1670. And then we got the name Giorgio Eduardo Oppido Prefecto, Reverendus Didi George Mollicus Winton. And then it continues in Latin. Now these are the ruins which you can see separate to the 13th century ruins but they were once connected but they're constructed from a completely different material and of a completely different design and they were built in 1520 by Lord Sandys of the Vine and you can see from this cutaway section of wall that the original construction is of brick so you've got Tudor brick and then it's clad with stone and mortar on the outside. Now it was intended when it was built to be the private burial place for members of the Sandys, Lord Sandy's family. So who was Lord Sandy? Well, Lord Sandy or William Sandys, first Baron Sandys of the Vine, was a diplomat and chamberlain at the court of Henry VIII and also a favourite of the monarch. So obviously a wealthy man and this explains how he could afford such a lavish building for his family. Now the chapel when intact had a vaulted roof which was said to depict lavish paintings of the prophets, apostles and disciples. These huge and beautiful window frames were once glazed with Flemish stained glass which was said to be an equal to those in Canterbury Cathedral. And this was removed during the civil wars of the 1640s, with some being placed in St Michael's Church in Basingstoke Town Centre. Alas, this was lost due to the result of German bombing during the Second World War. On his death in Calais, France in 1540, William Sandy was brought back to Basingstoke and buried here in the Holy Ghost Trinity Chapel. The whereabouts of his grave is unknown today, but his crest and arms still exist on this slab. Now the tower of the Holy Ghost Trinity Chapel displays the best preservation amongst these ruins. These empty alcoves show that their former occupants disappeared long ago, perhaps statues of the saints, definitely religious figures. So you may ask, how did the chapels come to be in the ruinous state that you see today? Well, two events are largely responsible. A fire in the town during the Civil War caused Queen Mary's School to be used as a pestilence house for plague victims, and at this point the guild ceased to exist. Around the same time, Oliver Cromwell and Parliament's army came to visit, and it's rumoured that the chapel's lead roofs were dismantled and melted down to provide lead to cast musket balls for the besieging force at nearby Basing House. And during their stay, both the Holy Ghost and the Chapel of the Holy Trinity were badly damaged. Despite the school continuing in the same place, incorporated into the tower remains, the chapels were abandoned, and after approximately 375 years of decay, today's ruins reflect those years of neglect. Now this block in front of us that looks rather like a daze is known as the Cottle Block, a memorial to Robert Cottle who was born in 1788. And he was a postmaster in the town and also the mayor on five occasions. And he died in 1859.
And here we have well, what looks to be like a bricked up fireplace. And then up there, we've got a door, I'm assuming, into the, the tower, which we'll look at in a minute, which is obviously on another level. There we've got the tower. We can get a little bit of a glimpse. So, at the moment, it appears to be used as storage for some, probably some of the older gravestones used and right in front of us right there is that another bricked up doorway and also if you look up on the wall hang on let's move this up a bit you can see evidence for a spiral staircase look at that once going up all the way to the top and then you've got another bricked up door there. More evidence of the spiral staircase just there. So from the Holy Ghost Chapel remains, marked on the ground is an estimation of where the original north wall would have stood. Now obviously it's long since disappeared and probably a consequence of, as I said earlier, the actions of Cromwell's army in the 1640s and then the subsequent disrepair of abandonment. Now, here in the former chancel is this guy. And this is the tomb of Sir William de Brebeuf. And apologies if the pronunciation is wrong. And he was the former Sheriff of Hampshire in the late 1270s and also a circuit judge of the south of England. And his very weathered tomb shows that he too is headless, but the legs, oddly enough, appear to be crossed. And there also looks to be a shield at his side as is befitting a knight of the realm. In addition to those historic effigies and graves to be found within the chapel ruins, the cemetery offers some other historic figures, some of national importance while others are more local. And here we have the grave of Alfred Millward, and he founded the nationwide Millward shoe shops, of which I'm sure I was bought a pair when I was at school. And he was born in 1837 and died in 1926. And just around the corner from Alfred Millward is the Burberry family plot. And in particular, Thomas Burberry. And he was born in 1835 and he was the owner and establisher of the international clothing manufacturer and he too died in 1926. Now if you've ever heard of the Mays Bounty Cricket Ground which is where Basingstoke play cricket and very occasionally Hampshire well, John May, born in 1837, he's responsible for establishing that. And he was also the mayor of Basingstoke for no less than six times. He's buried here on the right, and he died in 1920. So here we got the grave of John Aidan Little. And Little was born in, in the northeast in 1888 and he joined the Royal Flying Corps during World War I after spending time in the trenches. And on July the 31st, 1915, whilst flying a reconnaissance mission, his plane was hit by enemy fire and he was severely wounded. And with the aircraft crippled, he guided it to a safe landing, thus saving the life of his observer. A month after his brave deed, John Naden Little died of his wounds and he was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. 
One person who has no grave marker, and perhaps is deserving of one, is a lady known as Mrs. Blunden who lived in the 17th century. Married to William Blunden of Basingstoke in 1656, she was described rather uncharitably as a fat, gross woman who had accustomed herself many times to drinking brandy. One evening in 1674, while her husband was away on business in London, she consumed a large quantity of poppy water and fell into a deep sleep from which she could not be wakened. After examining her, an apothecary pronounced that she was dead. On being informed, her husband issued instructions that the funeral should wait until his return. But Mrs. Blunden's relatives had other ideas, and as the weather was very hot at that time, and to quote, the corpse being fat, she would fester, and so she was buried soon after here in the Holy Ghost Cemetery. A few days later, some boys playing in the graveyard thought that they heard voices coming from beneath the ground, informing their schoolmaster that they were initially thought to be making mischief, but others heard the voices too, and so her coffin was exhumed. On opening, her body was described as lamentably beaten. Unable to detect any sign of life, she was once again pronounced dead and she was immediately reburied. When the coroner arrived the next morning, it was found that she had inflicted further injury to herself by way of scratches all over her body and her mouth had been beaten bloody, while her winding sheet had been torn off. After being buried, Alive twice, Mrs. Blunden was this time pronounced very definitely dead, and the poor woman suffered no more. Now, in addition to the ruined chapels that we have here on the site, there were also another two chapels, and these were known as mortuary chapels. Unfortunately, there's absolutely no evidence of their existence here today. But the first of these would have been found approximately here in front of me, and it was known as the Episcopalian Chapel, and this was for the use of Anglican worshippers and their families. And built approximately in 1857-ish, it was a magnificent gothic design and the spire rose high into the air and here on top of Chapel Hill it must have been a magnificent sight. Unfortunately, with the cessation of burials in 1912, the chapel fell into disrepair and it was demolished in the early 1960s. Now the second of those mortuary chapels, unfortunately also long since disappeared, would have been found here in front of us. And this one was known as the Dissenters Chapel, and it was for the use of non-conformists, Baptists, Quakers, essentially non-Anglican worshippers. Again, this one was built in 1857, and to a similar Gothic design as the Episcopalian Chapel just over there. And the pair of them, their huge spires rising into the sky must have made an really impressive sight to a much, much smaller Basingstoke at the time. And as with the sister chapel, the Episcopalian, this too fell into disrepair after 1912 and was also demolished in the 1960s. So after looking at those mortuary chapels, we'll have a look at the map, starting off with a modern map and just get an idea of exactly where they were on today's landscape. Now in this overhead view, as always from the National Library of Scotland, you can see Basingstoke Station down here in the bottom right. And here we have the Holy Ghost Chapel. That's the one that was constructed in 1244, the oldest on site. This one we have here, this is the Trinity Chapel that was built in 1520. And the sites of the two mortuary chapels you'll see easier if we go back to the 1890s.
Okay, so we're back to the end of the 19th century. We've still got Basingstoke Station here, obviously. There's the Holy Ghost Chapel. Incidentally, it's it's stated there, the Holy Ghost Chapel School. Remember the school we talked about that was on the exact site? There's the Trinity Chapel. And here's the first of those mortuary chapels. This one here was the first one we looked at. That was the Episcopalian for the use of Angli Anglicans. And then we had the second one, the Dissenters Chapel, and that was essentially for the use of non-Anglicans. Now, as with many places and ruins around the country, a lot of the time there's the legend of a tunnel and the Holy Ghost is no different. And here, the tunnel is reputed to go to Basing House. Now, Basing House is at least a good mile in that direction. And what you've also got to understand is that here up on Chapel Hill, we're on very high ground. Basing House also is on higher ground. And in the middle, we have the Loddon Valley where the river Loddon flows. So the topography of the area also the distance would make it highly unlikely that there's a tunnel however as I stated earlier Cromwell's troops did spend time here and just think how useful a tunnel would have been in those days and that's not to say that a tunnel doesn't exist because it's known that beneath my feet in this area are vaults and crypts and it's highly likely also, if you think of the 16th and 17th centuries when Catholicism was banned and Catholic priests were in fear of their life, and surely if a tunnel exists, one must run from those vaults and crypts. Now, another interesting feature of the ruins here up on Chapel Hill are these paving stones in front of us. But they're actually gravestones. And in the 1950s and 60s, they was all erected here in the burial ground in front of the Holy Trinity Chapel. And it was cleared as the area was thought to look too messy and too dilapidated. This postcard of 1924 shows those graves in front of the Holy Trinity Chapel. And they was laid here to create this footpath. Unfortunately, where people have been walking on them, you can just about make out the wording on some of them, but they're very, very worn now, and I think that's a bit of a shame. I mean, look at this one here. It's, I mean, you can see the dates clearly, 1780, 1790 or 96. So that one alone is 230 years old. Today, in 2022, when the Holy Ghost Chapel commemorates 778 years since its construction, its location here on Chapel Hill, despite being in the centre of a large and very busy town, is peaceful and picturesque, with the dominating ruins being given grade 2 listed status. Compared to the shabby and unkempt look in the preceding years up to the end of the 20th century, the cemetery is kept tidy and planted with an abundance of wild flowers, thanks largely to a collection of volunteers known as the Southview Conservation Group. With this care and dedication, hopefully this site and these ruins will survive here for many years to come.